So Psalm 122 is still along the lines of what we call these Psalms of Ascent. Now, remember that there are a series of these Psalms and uh, they end, you know, uh, it, it's about 15 Psalms in total. And, and these Psalms actually are sung, um, they're sung as the people of Israel would make their way to Jerusalem for their yearly feasts. These Psalms of Ascent start in Psalm 120 and go to Psalm 134. And uh, there's about 15 of these Psalms in total that are labeled the Psalms of Ascent. And remember that the word Ascent means um, going up to. And so they're making their pilgrimage, if you will. These are what they would call pilgrim Psalms. And so um, it's believed that David authored three of these specific Psalms of Ascent. The one that we're looking at tonight is believed to be offered, authored by King David and also Psalm 124 and Psalm 133, ascribed to David as the author. And so here in Psalm 122, the emphasis is Jerusalem. And remember, the name Jerusalem or Jerusalem means uh, teaching or founded on peace the city of peace. And it's interesting because today, as we were talking this morning in just some of the news and what we're seeing, that uh, Jerusalem doesn't really seem like a peaceful place, but it is the city of peace. Here is the psalm in which we take that famous verse that says in verse 6 of Psalm 122, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Now, remember, I was sharing with you guys some years ago, one of my first trips to Israel um, this was several years back, and I remember sitting at a dinner in, I believe it was the city of Tel Aviv, the first evening we got there. And I remember that there was a Messianic pastor who came in, and he was just kind of encouraging the crowd. I believe he was some type of owner uh, or CEO of the company that we were using that was a touring company out there, and, and he was a believer. He was a Christian. He was raised, you know, uh, obviously in Israel, and his family converted to Christianity, and his dad was a very prominent messianic pastor and the dad passed away and the son took over the church and um, just a great great man of God and so anyways he starts talking about the do's and don'ts for all the first timers there in the land of Israel and he's saying listen you know this is appropriate this is inappropriate you know it's not like when you're you know here uh, you know at home you kind of just talk about Jesus as much as you want as a matter of fact he warned us he says do not go and try to pass out tracts or try to win somebody to Christ, you will be arrested. It is against the law to proselytize here in Israel. And so, uh, you know, the warning was really, really good in kind of making us, you know, know a little bit better perhaps of what we can, um, you know, watch out for, so to speak. But what's interesting about this is um, he then begins to say, you know, um, ultimately we are looking and waiting for the return of Christ is what he said. And then he says, you know, as the scriptures say, to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, everybody was like, amen, you know. And sometimes we say amen before we should. And um, he said, well, I'm going to ask you to not pray for the peace of Jerusalem because Jerusalem will never have peace. The only time Jerusalem will experience peace is at Christ's second coming. So rather, pray for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Then when the Prince of Peace comes, there will be peace in the land of Israel. Boy, that changed my whole perspective on this verse. We're so quick to take up. But I think tonight, we will take this verse up in the context of which it is written. The context and the backdrop is David. He's the author. And what we see here is the heart of worship and the heart of prayer in Psalm 122. David emphasizes the beloved city Jerusalem because prior to David conquering this Jebusite city, the place where God put his name for 400 years was a city called, a place called Shiloh. Uh, we refer to it as Shiloh, but the proper pronunciation is Shiloh. And Shiloh today still exists it, there in the land of Israel. And as a matter of fact, on this trip that we're going to, 39 days, um, we're going to be visiting Shiloh and the ruins. 
I've been kind of studying this whole thing already prior to getting there, and, and, and I'm excited. I'll be doing the teaching there. I pick all my spots before all the other guys. And uh, I started doing some research and come to find out that the footings where the tabernacle once stood are still in the proper place. A friend of mine who visited Shiloh a couple of times has gone there, and he says he took a laser, and they measured the footings, and they are the exact measurements that we find in the scriptures. The still same footings, and you can see the place where the altar once stood in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle. It, it stood there for 400 years. And then he says, as the people would come, you know, and or the scriptures say, as the people would come and they would offer up their sacrifices, remember that, they would take from their burnt offerings and they would consume their offerings, right? And they would eat them. The priests would get a portion. Uh, the people would also get a portion of various offerings. And what they would do is they would take their plates. They would sit all around the hillside and they would eat their meals. And when they were done, they would smash their plates. It was a common practice. And to this very day, there's pieces of plates scattered all over them hills around that area. It's an amazing thing. And that was the very place where God put his name. And that's what the Lord says. I will be worshipped where I put my name. Well, the city of Jerusalem wasn't always the place where the name of God was. As a matter of fact, the historical behind this city is found with David, the king of Israel. And we see that in 2 Samuel chapter 5, David defeated and conquered this Jebusite city. It was a city that sit upon a hill and, and David said, the man who breaks through the walls of this city will be the chief over these people. And remember, the Jebusite people were very proud people because their city sat upon a hill. It, was, it was, uh, had a tall wall around it. And in their mind, they began to taunt David and they began to say, listen, you couldn't get in here. You, you couldn't in no way get within the walls of these cities. And they taunted David. They said, listen, there's no way that you're going to be able to conquer and defeat this city. They even ridiculed David and said, the blind and the lame are greater than you. And ultimately, we know that David conquered the Jebusite city. You don't tell David, the greatest king Israel ever had, that he could not conquer a city. You tell him that, he'll take it. David did. And ultimately, David made this city, the Jebusite city, the place where he built his house. David built himself a palace there. And then it was some years later that David ultimately went and got the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And remember, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, David brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to Jerusalem, not to where the tabernacle was. And a lot of people get some confusion about the tabernacle in Israel. Well, David built a tabernacle himself there at Jerusalem when he brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord there. And this little tent that David had built was to him the place in which he would go and he would worship. And some believe that Psalm 122 was written as David was looking at the pilgrimage of the people coming from different areas of the known world, making their way to Jerusalem for their three feasts that they were to observe as faithful Jews. David rejoiced in being in God's presence. David loved to worship the Lord. David's heart was so knitted with the heart of the Lord. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 14 that he was a man after God's heart. It describes and speaks a lot about your own heart when you're pursuing the Lord. As a matter of fact, David's love was so great for God that we see Here's an encouragement to those that are making their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And that is this. Their pilgrimage to Jerusalem would be kind of this picture in this setting. That as these people would journey long trips and they would make long journeys to there, perhaps becoming weary, perhaps, perhaps becoming tired, hungry. But even more so, it was their love that made their burdens lighter. That's what love does. It makes burdens lighter and it makes distances shorter. And David kind of captures that in these nine verses of this psalm. And so know here that he goes on to describe this psalm as 
a song of ascent of David. And the picture here is the joy of going to the house of the Lord. Now, there should be a joy when we come to church. Not everybody is happy when they come to church. Some people are forced here. Some people don't care to be here. Uh, some people love to be here, though. And I often tell the ones who don't care to be here or are forced to be here, don't ruin it for the ones that love to be here. Ultimately, if you love to be here, love makes burdens lighter and distances shorter. When you love to fellowship with God's people and be in his presence, it changes everything. So coming to the place of worship should never be burdensome, ever. It should never be, I have to go. David will clearly state here, it's I get to go. I get to be a part of what God's doing. And so David writes these very words in verse one, your attention please. David said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I was glad when they said to me, well, yes, because of David's love for the Lord. Let us go into the house of the Lord. And the, the term house of the Lord, some would say, well, this could be the temple. But it couldn't be because David's the author. David was not alive when the temple was built. It was built by his son Solomon. And some would say, well, then perhaps maybe David is not the author. But when you look at Exodus chapter 23 in verse 19, also in Exodus chapter 34 in verse 26, in 2 Samuel chapter 12 in verse 20, what you find in these passages is the tabernacle itself is referred to as the house of the Lord. And some would say that perhaps maybe it's not the temple that is being spoken of here, nor the tabernacle that rested in Shiloh, but perhaps the tent that David pitched for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord at Jerusalem in 2 Samuel chapter 6. So David says in his own words, I was glad when they said to me. Remember, David was a worship leader. He sung. David played stringed instruments. Remember this morning I taught you guys that that um, the reason why they call the Sea of Galilee Kinneret. When you go to Israel, that's what you see. You'll see the biblical name, Sea of Galilee, but then you also see Kinneret. And the word Kinneret means stringed instrument. And they say if you look at the Sea of Galilee from heaven's vantage point, what you see is you see the Sea of Galilee shaped like a harp. And they believe that that shape of a harp is like the harp that David played as he led God's people Israel. So David was a worshiper at heart, but what fueled David's worship? What was it that set David on fire to worship the Lord? I think David shows us very clearly here that it was his great love for God. You see, there's no other person in the word of God that the scriptures say that is a man after God's own heart, but that of David. And it clearly shows here in David's writing, he says, I was glad when they said to me. See, the only people that could say to David are those within the community of David. David's talking about the people that dwell in the land of Jerusalem. It seems that the center and the focus of the people of Jerusalem was the worship of God. It's what they looked forward to. That should be the same heart and mind within the church, the body of Christ. We should have a desire to be among God's people and to worship the Lord God. There should be a desire as a community of believers to be in God's presence, to constantly be worshiping the Lord in some capacity in any which way that we can. I, I often say that there are many who come to the Sunday night service because, you know, they're, they're, they're working Sunday mornings, but yet they find themselves in fellowship Sunday night a desire to be in the presence of the Lord. So I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. David had a great, great love for the house of the Lord. Psalm 27, as we look at this psalm, I'll read it to you in verse four, is a psalm that, that, that we see of his great love for the house of the Lord. Notice what it goes on to say here. David says this, he says, one thing have I have desired of the Lord that I will seek 
that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, listen to this, all the days of my life. Why? To behold the beauty of the Lord. This was David's heart. This was David's exuberant declaration of faith, a psalm of David. And David is saying here very clearly, one thing I have desired of the Lord. What is the one thing you have desired of the Lord? What is it? You see, David's desire for the Lord was to be in the presence of the Lord. Think about it. Here was a man who had everything God had given him. God had given him a kingdom and David was reigning as king. Remember, under David's reign, the kingdoms were united. There was, there was a unity in the kingdom. And under David's reign, the kingdom of Israel prospered to great heights. And one of the debates is going back and forth as to the original promise that God had made Abraham in Genesis chapter 15 as to the land of Israel. Well, it was under David and his son Solomon's reign that Israel experienced the height of acquiring majority of that land, about 30% of it. Every other king after that never came close. And today, Israel obviously is nowhere near. But here's what we do see, that when Christ comes again, the greater than David, Israel will inherit all of the land. But here's the point that's being made. David says, with all this blessings and victories and everything that I was able and am able to do, what I desire more than anything is to be in the presence of the Lord. That I will seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. You see... David delighted in the Lord. He says, I desire, but he also delighted. What brings joy to your heart? It should be being in the presence of the Lord. We see also in Psalm 65, in verse 4, he goes on to say here, Blessed is the man you choose and cause to approach you that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, of your holy temple. Notice that. Blessed is the man whom you choose. Now, I, I like this here because it gives us this picture that, that God chooses us to dwell in his presence. You know, God, God desires, you know, us to be in this community where his presence is felt. Now, you know, people often say things like this. Well, you know, I don't got to go to church, you know, to get a hold of God. That is true. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. You can pray at home while we're praying here at church and you can experience God's presence. But the Bible also says in Hebrews 10 that we're not to forsake the assembling of the brethren. That we're not to... Say, well, you know, I don't need community. I don't need the church. I don't need. Now, listen, if the church. Now, remember, Paul kind of gives us good perspective in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and in 1 Corinthians 6. Take note of this. Paul talks about in chapter 3 that the church as a whole, we're the church tonight, just so you know, it's not this building that sits on the corner here of Rosina and Valencia. But you and I are the church. We make the body of Christ. And Paul said to the church at Corinth that they were the temple of the Holy Spirit. He reminded them of their responsibility, their devotion to the Lord, but also the holiness that they're to walk in. The church is to be holy. Why? Why should the church be holy? Because the church is God's representation on this earth of his presence and his power, his glory. So the best way you and I can experience God's presence is to be among the church. So that's one way. And collectively, together, when we worship, that's what we're doing. We're worshiping God. And we're experiencing his presence. And that's why you're affected by the worship. That's why you're affected by the teaching. 
you come to church and, and that song is played, right? And, and you're listening to the words. And, and this is why I, I always encourage people when they say things like, wow, you know, I, I'm just used to different kind of worship. Oh, that's been said about our fellowship. I'm just used to a different kind of worship. You know, I like the, you know, I like the worship pastor where you can move and, 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 and you know, and, and cut the rug a little bit. <laughs> I can respect that. But with all due respect, the worship is not for you, never has been and never will be. We're not worshiping you and we're not hoping you would like it. We're worshiping Jesus. And he hasn't complained. The Bible says he inhabits the praises of his people. So when it's said, I'm not feeling the worship, you shouldn't be because we're not worshiping you. We're worshiping Jesus. He's the center of our devotion. He's the one we look to. He's the one we're worshiping. And let me tell you something, guys. This is why we leave this place different. It's not just, you know, overwhelming sense of joy. Some of us leave this place like Somebody got me a sweater called the Sermonator. <laughs> and so when they gave me the sweater, the Sermonator, and I showed it with someone, they looked at me and they were like, yeah, you were the Sermonator tonight. <laughs> but that's what we should. The word should affect us in some way, right? The word of God should speak into our lives and change us. And it's an amazing thing because that's what happens even in the time that we're here. So that's God's doing. That's not the team and or the servants and or the pastor and or the teaching in and of itself. It is a work of the Holy Spirit that only God can do when his people gather together. So in one sense, like Paul told the Corinthians... You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You guys together collectively. Now, he also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's not talking about the church anymore. He's talking about me and you. He's talking about our lives, that, that because we have accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have the Holy Spirit in us. I'm not talking about good deeds, okay? I'm not talking about being nice. I'm not talking about helping people. Wretched sinners can do that better than most Christians. It's not what we're talking about. We're talking about living a holy life where your thoughts, your motives, and your heart is constantly held accountable to the purest of pure of the Spirit of God. God demands, not suggests, doesn't make a request when you can get around to it. God demands that we live a holy life. And that's done by the work and ministry of the Spirit in our own lives. That doesn't mean you're going to be a perfect man or woman, but that means this, that God puts his treasure, as Paul said to the Corinthians, in earthen vessels. That's us. And so we possess God's presence. The church together possesses God's presence. So David had a great love for the Lord. And he had a great love for the house of the Lord. Why? Because David experienced this. And it wasn't only David. It was David. And as he says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I like going to church. I really do. I like going to church and uh, when we're not here at Living Way and I have no responsibilities here as a pastor I'm not like looking for ways like oh, finally no service tonight I can go relax I'm, I'm usually at about two to three different churches during the week I like to be in church I like to be fellowshipping among the body of Christ constantly you know, looking to see how I can be a blessing and how I can also, when they come and they say to me, hey, you want to come to church with us? Yeah, if I ain't got nothing going on, you better believe I'm going to be there. Because there's something about being in the body of Christ. It's exciting. God's presence, the people gather. It's something different than what the world has to offer. And so David's love for the Lord's house, 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verses 1 through 3. 
we see there that these couple of verses give us a picture of David's love, his desire for the Lord. So then he goes on to say here in verse 2, Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Now the picture here is this. Remember he says, I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. One, because you're looking forward to the fellowship that you'll find in the presence of the Lord. But it says, Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. That this arrival at the city, they came with joy. They came with joy that every city had a gate that you entered in by. And at the city gate are found the elders and the leaders who make the decisions for the city. And typically there was a judgment seat at every city gate. It's kind of like the story in the book of Ruth when, when Boaz had to go and ask at the city gate for Ruth's hand in marriage. The elders needed to decide because... You know, remember, it was next of kin who would redeem the property or the land, if you will. But, but there was someone else before Boaz in line. And that needed to get checked before Boaz could go and ask for her hand in marriage. But it was done at the city gate, all these things. So they're standing at the city gate marveling at it. Because here it is, perhaps some making their first ascent to Jerusalem. Coming as a young man. And seeing the city of Jerusalem for the first time. And so the people would gather these three times out of the year. It says in verse 4 where the tribes go up. Yes, it, they did. They were commanded to. Exodus chapter 23. Verses 14 through 19. But they stood there. Within your gates, O Jerusalem. City of peace. And so one day the people of God will have a central place of worship. And that would be the city of Jerusalem. And ultimately, this is what it was being for, formatted into. You, you know, if you guys ever follow the life of David, we, we focus a lot on David and Goliath. And, and then, you know, as a kid. And then when you become an adult, you focus on David and Bathsheba. <laughs> right? It's like whenever we think of David as a kid, it's like, the kids don't know that David messed up with Bathsheba. All they know about is David and Goliath. But then when they you know, get a little older, you can talk to them about what David did. And then you do, and now they're adults. And when they think of David, they toss David and Goliath out the way. And they're just like, this guy really messed up. But David's entire life truly showed that he was a man after God's own heart. What, how is it that God could use a vessel like David, and yet we see the mistakes that David made? He made some great errors, guys. Very great errors. But the Bible says there was something in David that, not, that, that none can see with the human eye. God needed to reveal it and speak it to Samuel. And David, the Lord said of him, is that he was a man after my own heart. For God to say that you're a man after his own heart, well, that is the truth. David was indeed a man after God's own heart. Here's another thing that we find out about David that you see that in these atrocities in David's life, it cost the lives of others. David's sin affected the lives of his children. And David's sin caused his children to sin, caused his children to fall, caused his children to commit, commit great error and grievous sins. It's, it's as if, you know, you would say in one case, wow, you know, this is, you know, perhaps... David's fault but but no they were they were adult children but the Lord did say that these are the things that would transpire as a result of your sin and so we see with that you know David experienced great loss in his own family because of his sin Th these losses were because of his sin but then we also see that that wasn't the only time that there was great loss. In David's larger family, the kingdom of Israel, David lost, you know, four lives of his own family. But later on at the end of David's reign, he caused the death of some 70,000 in the land of Israel. And in both cases, David immediately repented, turned to the Lord, but 
the interesting thing, like I said, following David's life, you'll find even here David conquering this Jebusite city. When you look at the city of Jerusalem, it's on a hill. And it's not just any hill. It's a hill that has been in the land of Israel for years. And this very hill has great significance throughout the Old Testament. And it seems that David was not trying to, in his own wisdom and in his own power, but we see that David, being a man after God's own heart, fell within and perfectly well the plan of God because God was using David to ultimately prepare the one who would come through David's lineage. And that's the Messiah. That's why when you look at the genealogies of Jesus in Matthew and in Luke, they trace the genealogies to David's line. You know, what I think is interesting about this is that you see that when David first conquered this Jebusite city, there was a reason for that. To conquer it would mean that the blind and the lame would be healed. The greater than David came into the same city of Jerusalem, and that's what he did. He healed the, he healed the blind. The blind saw, and he healed the lame, and the lame walked. But that was a part of what David came to conquer. At the end of his life, David took the rest of the mountain... And this is where he offered up a, a sacrifice to the Lord as he purchased this plot of land from Aruna. And it's like if David was like, this was it. This was the final completion of what David was doing. So there was an aspect of his, you know, kingdom, but there was also an aspect of where God was working in David's life behind the scenes to prepare the way for Jesus. And then we see that when David purchased that, there in 2 Samuel, right around chapter 23, you'll see that David pretty much purchased the entire region of Mount Moriah, which was the mount years before, you know, some 1,500 years before that, that, you know, Abraham took his son Isaac to offer him up as a sacrifice. And when Isaac asked his father, where is the sacrifice in Genesis 22? He said the Lord will provide for himself the lamb. And there was never a lamb provided. It was a ram that was caught in the thicket. And ultimately, when Jesus comes on the scene and in John chapter one, John the Baptist sees him coming down to the Jordan. And John says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The lamb that Abraham was talking about was found in the person of Jesus Christ. And that statement of John the Baptist echoed back 2,000 years before. But, but David, David had no, had no clue of what God was doing. All he was doing was being obedient. But God used David to, to pretty much purchase this entire and conquer this entire region. Now Mount Moriah is on the scene. Why? Because David was preparing it. Because Abraham and Isaac were a picture of God the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the lamb that the father would provide as a sacrifice. David made that happen. Think about this. Even in his failure, God kept his promise. Remember what the Lord had told David. He says, David, listen. He didn't tell David if you're perfect. He didn't tell David if you never mess up. He said, if you keep my word, and walk in my statutes, there will always be a descendant of yours seated on the throne. David did that, maybe not perfect, but he did. And I kind of like the fact that David did it with imperfection. Why? Because it gives you and me hope. I, I mean, if David did it how Jesus did it, boy, we'd be done right now, right? right. Jesus did it without sin. David did it with sin. How is it that David could sin these great sins and still be used of God and yet be called a man after God's own heart? And then you see in Psalm 51, David's prayer after one of his great sins. Well, I'll tell you what, David was not only a sinner, he was a great repenter. And that's what gives us hope tonight. So the house of the Lord tonight is filled with with sinners saved by grace. We're not sinless. 
And please don't believe the lie that you've stopped sinning since you've become a Christian. You know, this false teaching of sinless perfection, holiness doctrine, what that does is that's just setting you up for the school of Pharisees. And you begin to look at yourself as better than others. But listen, guys, the house of the Lord is a place where we know that we can come and experience God's presence. And that's what you should be coming for. That you're going to sing to God. You know, it's always that thing in worship, right? They say, well, you know, hey, you know, Christians lie in church. They lie. When do they lie? During praise and worship. I mean, do you really give the Lord all your heart and all your soul? I live for you every moment I'm awake, every breath that I take. Lord, have your way in me. Is that really true? Ask your spouse. How does it go down in the morning when they wake up? Oh, they'll start telling you the war stories. You don't wake them up. That's how it doesn't go down. Let them sleep. <laughs> what happened to the godly man or godly woman that was worshiping Jesus last night at church? Oh, be quiet. <laughs> That's the awesome thing about the church. God takes imperfect man. And the Lord says, this is where I want to meet you. This is where I want to meet you. Think about that. Isn't that amazing? So now you see why David says, boy, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Some people are dragged to the house of the Lord. <laughs> there might even be some here tonight. But some people couldn't wait to get here tonight. Your feet were standing within the gates of Jerusalem, like these here, excited. Look at verse 3. He goes on to say, Jerusalem is built as a city. Look at that. It's built as a city. And look at what he says here, a city that is compact together. In other words, the idea here, compacted together or compact together, means firmly together as in the tent of the worship of meeting, the gathering. They are fitted together, one, they're whole. In Exodus chapter 26 and verse 11, it says, as you bring this tent, tie all the ends in together so that it can be fitted together, that this tent could be one. So the people in the Psalm of David's day they're saying this picture here. This is it. The people are knitted together. Like the body of Christ. We are to be knitted together. We are to be one in our worship, in our devotion. And he goes on to say here that the people, not only was the city beautiful, but the people were compacted together. The worship was one. They weren't worshiping various gods. Yeah, they might have been at different levels of their faith. But their worship was one. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together where the tribes go up. This is that yearly, three times a year. Remember, the feast that they needed to go up and observe was the, the feast of Passover, right? The feast of Pentecost and the feast of Tabernacles. These three feasts were the yearly feasts that they needed to go up and worship. So he goes on to say here, the tribes of the Lord, listen to this, to the testimony of Israel. What, what is that reference there to the testimony of Israel? Well, listen to this. It's referring here the ark, the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When you see in the book of Numbers, in chapter 1, in verse 53... And also in the book of Exodus, chapter 25 and verse 22, and Exodus 27 and verse 1, we see the same title that is given to the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. So here's the reference to the Ark. This is why many believe that the tabernacle that's being spoken of here is the tent that David built for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord while he brought it back to Jerusalem. You know, you know, the whole story there is David brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. This is where people say, oh, you know, I like that story. Why? Because David danced. Pastor, I want to dance in church. Why? Because I want to dance for Jesus. Well, do that at home. 
For starters, David didn't do it in the tabernacle and nobody ever did it in the temple, so why would you want to do it at church? And the only reason why you would probably want to do it at church is to draw attention to yourself. We should never have attention on who's moving more, who's yelling more, whose hands are higher than the other. The tall people will always win because their hands are always higher. But let me tell you something. God never looks at the outside posture. He always looks at the posture of the heart. So when people say, well, I want to go to a church where they dance, I tell them, well, then go ahead. Be like David. I want to be like Jesus. David brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And yes, he danced before the Lord because it showed David's love and devotion to the Lord. In other words, what David was saying was, listen, the Ark was more than just me trying to fulfill a promise. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord was showing my love and devotion to God. It, it was more to David than just that. David rejoiced in a ways that demonstrated what was in his heart. Now, yeah, there was a misunderstanding coming from David's wife at the time. Her womb was made barren because her statements had really nothing to do with his dancing. It had everything to do with, she says, you shouldn't lower your standards, if you will, to worship God. He doesn't deserve that type of worship from you. And it showed that her heart was different than that of her husband. And obviously David had a different heart for the Lord than his wife. And she paid the price. Not because God paid her back for the statement she made. She was actually telling her husband, don't embarrass yourself for God. He's not worthy of that. Have more respect for yourself. Those were her words. And that's my literal translation. If I were to translate it, that's what she was telling him. How ridiculous you looked. The problem was she didn't understand David's heart, nor did she understand David's love for God. And what she tried to do was get in the way of David's devotion to God. She tried to get in the way of what God declared about him when God said, he's a man after my own. You can't get in the way of what God is doing in a person's life. And so we see here that David was rejoicing because he knew the people would experience God's presence and glory. And it says here that the tribes of the Lord to the testimony of Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Guys, listen to this. Giving thanks to the name of the Lord was their greatest privilege. Listen, it was their greatest privilege to give thanks to the Lord. And today we don't need to go to a place because God does not dwell in temples made with man's hands. Acts chapter 7, verses 48 and 50. It's not where he dwells. People often say things like, we're going to God's house. This is not God's house. This building. Okay? This is not God's house. He doesn't live at 16725 Valencia Avenue, the city of Fontana. The church is God's house. Not the building. Those who attend the building. That's the church. And so... He goes on to say here that it is the privilege of them to come and give thanks to the Lord. It is, their, it is giving thanks to the Lord. It's their highest task. So when we come together as a body of believers, we come to give thanks to the Lord. It is a privilege to be here. It is a privilege to do this. And it says this. Here's another reason why. One part of it is praise and one part of it is glory and one part of it is majestic and one part of it is there's joy. As David says, I was glad when they said unto me. But another part of it is justice and another part of it is righteousness and another part of it is holiness and another part of it is truth. Look at verse 5. For thrones are set there for judgment the thrones of the house of David. I love that. It's not saying that there's a throne set in Jerusalem. It says thrones. 
In other words, we see that David sought counsel and wisdom from advisors, even in his own family, 2 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 18. See, so the place of government was in view here with the people of Israel. It was a place of justice, like in Jeremiah chapter 21 in verses 11 and 12. When the world has no government, God's people offer it. God's people offer it because God's church is the seat. It is the center of government. If justice is not found here on this earth and it's found nowhere, God's church is government. It's justice. Every, at least this nation, we can speak of this, was founded on biblical principles. This great justice. Jerusalem was a place that was looked to not only as the place of worship, but the place that brought justice, divine justice, for that matter. And so he says, because of that very thing, verse 6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray, listen to this, for the often elusive peace. Because how many of you guys know, since David has quoted this and made this statement, there has yet to be peace in Jerusalem. You see, the God of peace, the Prince of Peace, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, Romans chapter 15 and verse 33, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20. True peace will come when Christ comes again and establishes his kingdom. So when we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, you know what we're really praying, guys? You're praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. You're also praying, Revelation 22 and verse 20, even so, come, Lord Jesus, quickly come. This is what we're doing. We're praying so that Christ would come because that's when the people of Jerusalem will have peace. You know, the stage is just being set so much for that. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Notice that now he's saying he's praying for those. He is praying for those who pray for Jerusalem. You know that there's a blessing when you pray for Jerusalem, when you pray for the people of Israel. I pray a lot. It's, Lord, I pray that, that their eyes would be open, that there would be a great revival. And I know when that will ultimately happen, but I pray still. And notice what he says here, that you may prosper. Well, the word here, prosper, is not the typical word for the prosperity of wealth and riches. As a matter of fact, it's the Hebrew word that means quietness and rest. Meaning what? That if you pray for the peace of Jerusalem out of love and devotion to God's people, you will find rest for your souls. There is benefits and blessings to, to pray first and foremost to the Lord, but, but even more so for his people. Peace be within your walls. Prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say, peace be within you. He prays for his companions. Notice what he's saying. I, I pray this, peace be with you. Everybody say shalom. shalom. That means peace, but say shalom, shalom. shalom, shalom. That means peace be with you. That's what it means. And so the reference here is he's saying, for the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say, peace be within you. Shalom, shalom. Jerusalem founded on peace, but yet it's worn out with war and division. But the day will come where it experience great peace. And look at verse 9 as we close tonight. It says, because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Because we can experience God's presence. Because there is a place in which the body of Christ. Guys, do you see how we can create an atmosphere of our gathering together where people will seek out the good of the Lord? It's this, this picture, right? You get, you get somebody that gets in this crowd here and they'll say something like, man, you know, I feel love there. I feel, 
I just, I, those people are always happy, right? It's crazy. You know, I don't say nothing when somebody comes to me and they've experienced something with somebody in this church and I like know them, know them. And they're like, they're just the happiest, sweetest person in my mind. I'm like, yeah, they are. <laughs> I'm like, what happened? <laughs> yes. They, well, praise God. Hey, they're excited. That's all that matters to me, right? I ain't going to tell them like, I oh, just wait till you get to know them a little bit more. No, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not doing I'm just like, well, praise God for that. The Lord just used Debbie Downer and whoever else to help this person out. But people experience that. And then they say, I just, I just want to be around you guys all the time. You know that there's people that actually like that. There's people that actually want to be around you. Other than the little babies that have no one else to go to but you. But there are people that want to be around you. Literally. Not, not because you're like just this, this great person. There's something that God does within us. That, that binds us together, right? Have you ever just sat back and, and looked at the body? It's, it's difficult for me because I'm trying to meet everybody in this church. We got visitors all the time. And there's just a lot of people that come in and out of this place. But, you know, you guys come to service after service. You guys should, like, all know each other. But you don't. And when I'm talking to someone, I'm like, you know the guy, you know the guy. And you're like, no, I don't know the guy. What guy? You know the guy. He wears his hat all the time. This is the hat, same hat. Got sweat stains all around it. That guy, no, just kidding. <laughs> Sorry if you have a hat with sweat stains. It wasn't you, I'm just saying that. But it's that, that's how we describe it. We start describing them by, nope, I never seen that guy. And then they start describing somebody else. You're like, yeah, that might be them. We don't know. And then we see the picture and we're like, oh no, that's not what I'm talking about. But, but listen, here we are. Do you guys know that tonight you're a family? You're a family. And when you leave here tonight and you go home or wherever you go and somebody says, hey, where were you? You're going to say this. I was at church. And then they might respond this way. Well, what church did you go to? What church? As if church is a place where a bunch of people that don't know each other gather. And you talk as if you've left a place where you didn't know nobody, and you didn't really care to know anybody. But what you should say is, I was at church with my family. Then they're going to say something like, oh, wow, your parents go to church? <laughs> you see how people's minds think? You say, no, the family, the body of Christ. Well, didn't you just start going to that church? Yeah, it's my second service, but they're family. Right? So act like it. God binds us together. And he brings us together by his presence and his power. And David says, I was, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We need to be glad when they say to us, let us go to the house of the Lord. Why? Because the house of the Lord is the place where God hears our worship collectively together as a church. You might not feel it, but he does. He inhabits the praises of his people. The church is the place where we partake in God's word and we open up our heart to allow the Holy Spirit to speak into our lives. And without even realizing it tonight, regardless of what you're going through and what you're feeling, listen, you might not see it now, but guess what? It comes out. Eventually, you're going to see the seed that God has planted by the work of the Holy Spirit through the message that's being taught. And if you just take advantage of your extended family, and you realize that before you guys were even born, God had already put this whole thing together. That doesn't blow you away as much as it blows me away because it does blow me away. As I shared with you guys before, when I planted this church, I didn't even know the person that I planted it with. But that was the first person I met. Now there's over 600 people that call this place their church. And it's amazing to see how God is working in that and, and, and to see that I wouldn't have known you guys if it wasn't for the Lord.